Rub up your engines! Well, here's bad news for you car buyers out there. 31% of the new cars went over sticker price. They're starting to come down, but now they're just going back to charging more for them. Well, look at GM. They shut down truck production for a while because they said, oh, we got too many of them. Yeah, they went to make it look at the dealers like they don't have enough trucks so that they'll jack the prices up the ones that are on the lot. It's just scumbaggery, if you ask me. Now, the average new price that cars sold for was $45,296, but $41,637 was the average sticker price, the MSRP. So you're talking about almost $4,000 they just add on to it to rip you off. You know what I say? Don't buy one. If they keep charging more, tell them, like a guy did here. He wanted to buy a Toyota Corolla Hybrid. They wanted 30 something grand. He said, he looked around. He got one for 23 grand in Colorado. He flew out there, went skiing and came back. Price around. Don't accept the crap they throw in your face. There still is some kind of competition around. Maybe you got to go a little bit further. But look, the guy saved over $10,000. So what the heck? Take a plane trip, go skiing and come back. It more than paid for the ski trip and the plane ticket, right? And here's the worst ones out there, the 10 worst. Genesis GV70. The MSRP is 44 and they went for 56. Wranglers, it was 35. They went for 44. Porsche Taycan, 100 grand. They went for 122 grand. Well, anybody who's dumb enough to buy a Porsche, let them throw their money away. I don't care. The Wrangler Unlimited, 45,000. They went for 55,000. Cadillac CT4V, 57,000. They went for 69. The Genesis GV80, 56. They went for 68. And on and on and on. They're just charging way too much money for the cars. Don't buy them. That's a suggested retail price. They're going to jack them up. Just don't buy them, people. The only power we have is if you don't buy their crap, they can't sell it. It's not like you breathe air, you got to have air to breathe. You do not have to go buy a new car. You don't have to buy their new car. You can't allow these dealers to charge more than MSRB because if you do, they all will. They'll say, hey, Joe's doing it. I'll do it too, you know? They're all greedy. They're going to try to get as much money as they possibly can. So don't buy their stuff. Just don't buy it. Eventually, they got to lower their prices if people don't buy it. They're actually raising them. So here's a manufacturer's suggested list price what and they're getting 12 grand more for some of them don't buy them so i'll sit up film says scotty i'm thinking of buying a rear wheel drive car but i live in maine where winters are slushy as 7-eleven big golf how can i optimize a 50 50 bounce rear wheel drive car to perform well in snow you know it's rear wheel drive the front wheels don't drive but you got a rear wheel drive car you can have the engine in the front and then the transmission behind it and then the rear wheels drive it so a lot of the weight is in the front most guys will put weight in the trunk in the winter then they'll get sandbags or whatever and put them on the left and right side over the wheels to get more weight in the back that's about the only thing you can do other than you'd want to put snow tires on the thing for sure at least in the back because uh, those are the drive wheels and really for control and stuff you'd probably be better off putting snow tires on all four wheels because you're going through a lot of slush and snow and it's going to go through the frozen mush better than regular tires. The main thing would be putting weight because most of your weight's in the front and you want to put more weight in the back. George Strobel says, Scotty, how hard it is to make a two-wheel drive truck four-wheel drive? If you want to do it right, it's pretty hard because you got to put on a transfer case. You got to set up all the linkage for the front. You're better off buying a four-wheel drive. If you got a two-wheel drive vehicle and you want a four, sell yours and buy a four-wheel drive unless you want to spend and years mucking around in a garage welding and trying to make things work uh, you're better off buying one than you are even if let's say you somebody's got one and the four-wheel drive is broken well fix it because it's a lot easier to fix a system than it is to install a whole new one on one that doesn't have it. Luke T says the cigarette light power outlet my car stopped working after I used a portable air pump how would I go out fixing it well first just look for the fuse probably pop the fuse right they put another fuse in now if it didn't the cigarette lighters aren't used to put out all that much power so sometimes it will break that socket inside there and they do unscrew and come out and you can buy a replacement one at most places that you can rewire yourself to put in there if you want but usually they just blow the fuse but if they didn't you'll see pieces are loose retighten it in they are just bolted together if it's all loose you can retighten it back in and then put the fuse in and that could fix it. legend says scotty does higher octane gas clean your engine not really higher octane gasoline is for really high compression engines and the way it works is lower octane gas under a certain pressure it will ignite 
faster than high octane gas. So you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, you think, well, if it burns faster and quicker, it'll have more power. You can't have it burn fast if you have a high compression engine. The low compression engine, fine, compresses it low, and then it ignites it with a spark, and away you go. But high compression engines, if the gas was too low octane, it'll knock because it'll get pre-ignition. It'll fire before it's supposed to because the pressure so much, it starts to fire itself before the spark even hits it. So. No, you don't need high octane and a low octane engine. Most engines run on regular octane these days, but the real high performance ones, like Lamborghinis and Maseratis, they're made for high test gas because of the way they're designed, and you gotta buy it. But most, like Lexus and stuff, they'll run better with high octane and get better gas mileage, but they'll run perfectly fine on the low octane because the computer can compensate for it. Rick says, Scotty, on a scratch question, what's the difference between rubbing and buffing compounds or polishing compounds? The only difference is, the amount of grit that's in them, right? If they're really, really gritty, you know, you're going to take off big chunks, but leave more of a scratchy surface. Then if they're medium, they can take off medium scratches without scratching too deep. And if you just want to polish it, the polishing are really fine. Sort of polishing is like our toothpaste, right? You're polishing your teeth with toothpaste. If you used a really rough rubbing compound on your teeth, you'd wear the things down to nothing, right? You can actually polish some stuff off with toothpaste on your car. Like say if you're a plastic headlight cover, are kind of foggy, you can actually put toothpaste on them and buff them around and they'll get shinier. Yeah? I don't advise it. It's not really made for that. There's better stuff to do it. But the only difference is how much grit they have. And the finer they are, then the finer the grit. And then they'll polish and look shinier and they won't leave deeper scratches. But of course, if you really have messed up paint, you got to start with a rougher one because the fine one isn't strong enough to get deep enough to get rid of the crappy paint that's all falling off. Modern cars, you just want to you know, get the fine of stuff and polish them with that all the time. You don't want to mess with anything else, but if you're trying to get blemishes off, yeah, then you got to figure out, do you want the really rough, the medium, or the fine, and you got to experiment with different areas first, like the bottom where you can't see it that well, and decide, well, what should I start with, rough, medium, or fine? Jerome says, hey, how can I tell if a control arm is bad? Okay, on your suspension, you got control arms, right? Well, the easiest way to do it is jack the car up in the air, so both front wheels are off the ground, right? Have somebody pull the wheel. If it's going clunka clunka, while they're pulling, with jack stands under the car so you don't kill yourself, go under there. You go to the control arm, if you see it going clunka clunka, you know, it's worn, then you replace it. That's the easiest way to tell. Because when you pull on the wheels, you hear clunking, then go under there, and you'll be able to see what's moving. And you see the control arms moving, you know it's gone, and you can replace it. And if you don't want to buy a bunch of tools, realize a lot of auto parts store like AutoZone or Rally, they loan you tools free. You buy the control arm from them, they'll loan your tools, you can take it apart. You wouldn't have to buy all the stupid tools, you can just loan them. Marina says, Scotty, what is your opinion on a 2009 Honda Odyssey with 150,000 miles? All right, I'm not an Odyssey fan because they have had engine cam problems and they've also had big time automatic transmission problems. Now, if you're thinking about buying something like that, if a guy like me at least check it out with his fancy equipment to tell you what shape is the engine and transmission in. And if the transmission isn't working right and has problems, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Now, quite a few of those had the transmission replaced by Honda Free. If they've got a receipt that the transmission has been replaced, eh, maybe not that bad of an idea to buy one. But they have had problems. I would buy... 10 Toyota Siennas with 150,000 miles before I'd buy one Honda Odyssey with 150,000 miles on it, just to give you an example. Aunt Jordan says, Scotty, my 11 Cadillac DTS has 205,000 miles. How long will a 4.6 North Star engine last? It's got 163,000 miles when I bought it, now it's 205. Well, you're getting lucky, but they didn't have the big head gasket problems that the earlier ones did. I have never seen an earlier one that went even near 163,000, like when you bought it, before the head gasket blew and it cost a fortune, they're racing engines to rebuild them. Absolute fortune. So, if yours doesn't burn oil, isn't overheating, just keep taking care of it. You never know. Mr. Zendera says, would you consider getting a boat in the next few years? No, because my son already bought one. <laughs>
<laughs> he bought a really nice $45,000 cruiser we take on Kentucky Lake, zooming around in that thing, so I didn't buy them too cheap. He always wanted a boat. When he was a kid, he was looking at yachts, so at least he didn't buy a million dollar yacht. It is fun to ride around in. I mean, uh, I'm too cheap to spend that kind of money, but he bought it, and we all ride around with it with the grandkids, so I'm not going to buy one. We got one now, and we don't use it all that much, so it'll probably last a lifetime. I'll take care of it so it won't fall apart, and it is a fiberglass boat, so it won't rot, and it's those cool boats that even though it's a regular boat it's got the dual hull design so it really handles well you don't have to worry about them flipping over and they go really fast with that dual hull design so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos remember to ring that bell